You're watching LMCC. I'm so glad you're all here on this beautiful evening. I don't know if I would be here <laughs> if I hadn't had to be here, but thank you. I'm glad you're all here. We're going to talk about one of my favorite people to talk about is Arthur Dyer, boat builder. I've been fascinated by him, uh, and I think, I hope I'm going to be telling you a, a good story here. Arthur Dyer's family, it begins in Addison, Maine. To understand Arthur Dyer and his great talent, you only need to look at his family history. Arthur Dyer's family came from a town, came from Addison, Maine, and one of their major industries was boat building. Maine's first people were the Wabanke Indians, who were building birch bark canoes long before the Europeans arrived. In the late 19th century, those who lived in Maine transformed these into wood, wood and canvas canoes. Does that sound familiar? Arthur Dyer's grandfather was Harris Dyer, and he was a sea captain, as you can see here from the 1850 federal census. It showed Harris Dyer's occupation as a sea captain. Also during the 1850 census, the census takers collected info on farming. Harris, his grand, uh, Arthur's grandfather, also farmed 100 acres and continued to do so into the 1870s. Arthur's father lived a long life. He was born in 1806, excuse me, Arthur's grandfather lived a long life, born in 1806 and he died in 1872. During his life, Harris was married not one, not two, not three, but four times. His first wife was Ann Witten Dyer, and she was the mother of, of Harris's first four children, which included Arthur's father, Solon, and his uncle, Enoch, and they both lived here in Deep Haven. Thank you. They both came, uh, Harris's second, uh, his first wife, was Ann Witten Dyer, and she was the mother of four. His second wife was Mary Jane Watts, and she was the sister to his first wife. And were married only one year, and she died at 27. His third wife was Louise, 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 Louisa, I'll get it straight, Goodwin Dyer, and he died, she died at 854. His fourth wife, she, according to several years of the US censuses, Harris was anywhere from 38 to 41 years older than his wife. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> Through four wives, he was the father of nine, nine children and six grew into adulthood. Solon Hunter, Hunter, Solon, excuse me, Solon Hunter Dyer, who was Arthur's father, again, grew up in Addison, Maine, and married his first wife, Mary Thompson, when she was 22 years old. She died during the first year of their marriage. One could speculate maternal morality on the early death of his wife at such a young age. By the time he earned his living, his father did, which, he did what his father did, was which building boats during the winter and farming the rest of the year, which were both seasonal work. According to the Maine 1850 census, Dyer family produced 14 tons of hay and 10 bushels of Irish potatoes at the Madison, Maine farm. In February 4, 1895, Sawin Dyer was picked as a juror for a sensational mur murder trial. And several of the jurors were interviewed by the Minneapolis Journal and Sawin told the reporter his history. In the article, Sawin spent about nine years at sea with his father Harris, who was the master of the vessel. He also learned from his father the trade as a shipbuilder. In 1849, Sawin went around Cape Horn to San Francisco and spent three years in the gold region. 
He returned home by the way of Nic Lake Nicaragua, and this is prior to the Panama Canal, and then he stopped in New York. In 1858, San went to Pikes Peak to search for gold again. 1859, he came home to Wright County, Minnesota, and got a land grant of 80 acres and farmed 37 acres of it. Solon and his new wife, Martha Terwall Dyer, married in, in January 18, 1863 in Independence in Hennepin County. In August 1863, Solon, aged 31, along with his brother, Enoch, who was 26, signed up for three years of the Army, which was during the Civil War. They served along the Canadian border tracking the Dakota Indians. They were mustered out of service in 1866. Arthur Dyer was the first child born in 1870 to Sawin and his wife, Martha. Around 1879, Sawin moved to Excelsior where he picked, up, picked back up his trade as a boat builder and repairer. I just went backwards here. Here we go. According to historian Ellen Wilson Meyer, Dyer built two rowboats, rowed them to Stubbs Bay to Gideon's Bay on Lake Minnetonka. On Gideon's Bay, he set up a camp and spent the summer guiding fishing parties. During the winter of 1877-78, he brought his family to the campsite and built a miniature shipyard. He also set up a ferry between Excelsior and the Lake Park Hotel. What you see up here, Lake Dyer's Lake, I can hardly read it in the sun, sorry about that, Park Ferry. I'll read it to you what it says, it's pretty funny. From Gideon's Bay Shore, Excelsior to Lake Park, in caps, careful and trusty oardsmen, leaves on call or signal large, safe, and clean boats, which are not entrusted to boys to handle. <laughs> to go safely, be sure and take Dyer's boats near the commons. I just thought it was great. So if you don't know who Ellen Wilson Meyer was, she was a local Deep Haven resident and an historian who wrote seven books on Deep Haven, Wyzetta, Excelsior, and Lake Minnetonka. Her first book was published by the ELMHS in 1978. She passed away in 2008 at the age of 95, and I will, will once again mention her. Solon and his wife Martha and their two boys, Herbert, 13, and Arthur, 11, made home on the shores of Gideon Bay next to the Commons in Excelsior. He opened, Solon opened his business H.S. Dyer and Son, and this is where Arthur, now in his early teens, learned the art of boat building from his father. This was also where Son and Arthur Dyer met Hazen Burton and his son Ward. The Burtons were from Boston and started coming to Minnesota, where they would stay at the, at the Lake Park Hotel. Burtons learned to sail on one of Son's slooped rig whale boats, gaining knowledge and confidence both fell in love with sailing. Uh, is this not a spectacular house or what? This is what the Burtons built for themselves that were not too far from where the boatyard was. They loved Minnesota, came here every summer, so this was their summer home. There's the front and back of it. Um, it they called it Wilton Cottage. It was, the home was located according to Scott McGinnis, um, approximately at 173 Second Street in Excelsior. The house was built by Robert McGrath and he was also the architect of it. I think he just did a wonderful job on it. One of the first boats Sawin built with the help of his brother Enoch was the Osprey. It was built in 1882 and launched in, the, in May of 1883 on Lake Minnetonka. That year, the new sloop won the 4th of July championship pendant and a silver cup from the Minnetonka Yacht Club. Ward Burton told a sad story that was retold to him from his father. The Osprey was returning from a race it had participated in 
in, on July 12, 1885. Sol and Dyer, Hayes and Burton, and a small crew were heading back from to, to Deep Haven when a threatening storm started to roll over Lake Minnetonka. The Osprey and crew made a dash to safety and managed to anchor the Osprey from the storm under the lee of Big Island. From their view, just, sorry, my story's long. From their view, they saw a small steamer um, trying to get away from the storm. The small steamer was named the Mini, Mini Cook, heading towards Wyzetta to beat out this coming storm, but they watched in horror as the steamer was being overtaken by the storm and the Mini Cook sank with all aboard that afternoon off Spirit Island. Ten lives were lost that day. Nine of those were lost were from the Alonzo Cooper Rand family. A.C. Rand, as he was known, was the mayor of Minneapolis for two terms from 1878 to 1882. Another interesting story, the Mary. The steamer Mary, originally built in 1876, the boat was found not to be properly ballast, which made the boat sluggish and top-heavy, and her propeller was too close to the surface. These and many other problems led to the suicide of the owner, Frank Helstead, during the summer of 1876. Sawin Dyer was then hired to properly ballast the boat, and the Mary was back on Lake Minnetonka, running smoothly until July 1, 1880, when it was docked in front of the St. Louis Hotel, the Mary's boiler blew up. Eight people were injured and four people died. The boat remained submerged, get this now, it remained resubmerged in front of the St. Louis Hotel until August. Saul and Dyer was called to repair the boat during the winter and the boat was almost entirely rebuilt. It was determined the boiler was to blame because of the faulty manufacturing. Mary was back on the water and renamed the Hiawatha with a modern firebox boiler. With a change in ownership and several name changes, it was last on the lake on Lake Minnetonka in 1886. Hazen Burton and Ward. Hazen and Ward Burton, I should say. Arthur Dyer was 15 and at, this, at this little story, and Ward Burton were 10 years old. They grew up together, spending time at Saw and Dyer's boat works. Again, it was where the Burtons learned to sail. Arthur, at age 20, built the Hermes, a 16-foot cat boat for Ward Burton, which was launched in 1891 and won the special class division in 1892 with the Minnetonka Yacht Club. What I didn't know, what a cat, I didn't know what a cat boat was. It was, it's a broad beam sailboat with a single sail mast set forward in the bow of the boat. The story goes that cat boats got their name in New England because they had to shoo all the cats away from the boats because all the fish were being caught. Who knows, that might be a nice little story. Cat boats were popular in the East Coast, which kind of makes sense why Saul and Dyer would build them. They were popular as a seaworthy boat because they're of their hull shape. Shallow draft and it's simple to manage and you can sail it even with one person on it. Loving the lake life, the Burtons purchased 90 acres on Carson's Bay on Lake Minnetonka and built the boathouse first. That's how much they love sailing. They built the boathouse first. At the time, it was the largest boathouse on the lake and built two years before the Burtons built their home. In June 14, 1890, in the issue of the Northwestern Tourist, it was reported the boathouse had a large workshop for boat building and repairs for the Dyers. In, August, in 1892, Sawin, now 60 years old, dissolved S.H. Dyer and Son 
Arthur, at age 22, was now on his own. The home and the, uh, the, the, home and the boathouse were both designed by architect William Channing Whitney. Another early boat of Arthur Dyer's was the Kestrel. He told the Minneapolis Tribune that the Kestrel was one of the first boats he completed in 1891 at his Carson's Bay location. This boat helped establish Arthur Dyer as a yacht builder. The yacht was built for Representative James T. Wyman, who originally was from Maine. He represented Hennepin County in the Minnesota House of Representatives from 1893 to 1895, and the Senate from 1895 to 1899, and the Kestrel was sailed by his son, Roy Wyman. It sailed with the MYC from 1891 to 1901. Ah, the Anawa. The Anawa was built in the winter of 1892 at the Burton Boathouse. The boat was so radical that it was built under lock and key and the windows were frosted over in the workshop. The Anawa was built for Ward Burton. The Cedarwood boat which consisted, was considered revolutionary in design, which sailed over the top of water instead of plowing through the water. The hull, the, the hull was built of flat ribs, thin planking, and covered in yellow canvas. Guys, yellow canvas. It's not white, but as they restored it, just to let you know. Um, interesting, Arthur Dyer may have had an idea taken from Hey, Jane. <laughs> they take, uh, uh, let's see. The hull was built of, let me, I'll repeat myself. The hull was built of flat ribs, thin planking, and covered in can, yellow canvas. Interesting, Arthur Dyer may have had an idea taken from the canoes of the First Nations tribe of Maine. They made canoes made of planks and then covered it with birch bark. By the beginning of the 19th century, an external waterproof canvas shell was fastened to the wood hull, formed by cedar planks and ribs. No one thought of using cedar planks and ribs for a yacht before Arthur Dyer did it with the Anawa. According to the Minneapolis Tribune, the Anawa of Lake Minnetonka was the fastest boat in American waters, and by, and once again, it had a yellow, a yellow uh, canvas. Oh, the sun is left. How nice. Top finishers for, for Dyer's Boats on July 15, 1893 at the Minnetonka Yacht Club. Not a bad day for Arthur Dyer. This article is from the July 16, 1893, St. Paul Globe newspaper. Six of dire boats placed at the MYC. The Minneapolis Times carried a feature on Arthur's saying his boat building fame extended from Minnetonka to Marblehead, the mecca of New England yachtsmen. So the Ottawa Water Witch, the Apuka, Kestrel, Kingbird, and the Hermes all placed that day. <coughs> Here's a cute story. It's from July 16, 1893. Hazen, was Hazen Burton was downtown working at his clothing store called the Plymouth. He came back by train to Lake Minnetonka and was in the NYC race, which he won, he took the train back to his store before the last boat finished the race. <laughs> then that evening, he took a train to Boston. Now, can you get around as easy as that some days here? I don't know, but I just thought it was a really interesting story. Here's a great story. William Pete was an avid sailor and Vice Commodore of the MYC in 1893. This letter, and I know it's hard to read, but I'll pretty much tell you what it said. 
accused Warren Burton of sailing to Ottawa and attacking his yacht, which was called the Kite, during the July 4, 1893 race. He accused him in a manner unbecoming a gentleman. Ward was 18 years old at the time, and William Pete was 38. He accused Ward Burton of deliberately and maliciously tried to impede further progress of the kite. We will never know the real reason for the altercation, but Pete had just received delivery from Bristol, Rhode Island of his new sloop, the kite, from a very well-known boat builder named Nathaniel Harishoff just that year. Maybe he was a little angry he lost? Who knows? We don't. One will never know. But this is the end result here. Here's the above letter signed by William D. Samus, Secretary and Treasurer. And I know it's probably hard to read. It's dated November 13th to H.J. Burton. Dear Sir, I have to inform you that at a meeting of the NYC held on the 12th as such, your resignation was read and accepted, yours truly. William Samus. So he resigned. The, the Dyers, re, excuse me, the Burtons re, reside, resigned over this little tift that uh, William Pete had. So what was the real reasons for the altercation? In 1894, Pete was elected comm Commodore the following year of the NYC. The results were changed in the rules. Boats must have overhangs both forward and aft. Extreme lightness of construction and unusual design was prohibitive, <laughs> uh -huh, such as catamarans and canoes. What was the end result? The Burtons resigned from the MYC and the Ottawa was retired. According to the St. Paul Globe, the Anna was retired by the Burtons, who believed the change in the Minnetonka Yacht Club's rules was to take the, um, the Ottawa out of, out of competition. So they felt it was very pointed at them. Article on Arthur Dyer's new future home on Carson's Bay. So this is Carson's Bay, if you're familiar with it. You can see where the railroad goes by. Freshly dug pile of dirt, which has been thrown up on the south shore of Carson's Bay near the Minneapolis and St. Louis Bridge is substantial evidence of one of the latest schemes of H.J. Burton. The earth is to be converted to a habitable island, an oc occupancy of a new boathouse and shop for Dyer. At the present structure in St. Louis Bay may be removed. I have no idea what they're talking about the St. Louis Bay and having Dyer there. I haven't been able to find any evidence that he actually had something uh, in St. Louis Bay. So Hazen Burton dredged up a part of Carson's Bay in June of 1894, which created the island for the new workshop for Arthur Dyer. It was also twofold because the bay was shallow and the uh, the waters were swampy around his new home, and so if you see the, the arrow pointing downwards, that's where Chimo was built, Hazen Burton's, uh, and that's where his boat yard, or his boat uh, uh, house was also. So this was kind of, it killed two birds with one stone, as they say. He created a man-made island for Dyer and saleable waters for around his home. Now this is taken and uh, this is drawn in 1912, but this is very, was very current with what uh, Arthur Dyer's boatyard looked like on his little island. Um, this is again from the Sanborn Insurance map. As you can see, the boat storage was a big part of Dyer's business, with two buildings just for storage. As you can see, the two, the both on both ends, he had storage. The boat works was next to the tracks of the Minneapolis and the St. Louis Railroad. You can see it down here further also, when it ran across the little isthmus there. 
The tracks are gone today, but across the street from the where was once the tracks is now the great trail maintained by the Three Rivers Park District, which I really love and use it myself. Whose idea was the Anawa? Hazen Burton said, and this is from the, I should tell you, the Boston Globe, June 9th, 1895. He said, my son, Ward C. Burton, is the owner of the Ottawa, and Arthur Dyer was the designer and the builder. It is true we all had many consultations covering all essential points of design and construction. But in the few instances where we did not think alike, the decision was left to my son, who was to own and sail the boat. But the lines were finally drawn and the model made by Dyer, who was the only professional connected with the work. Let's go to some of the boats that ended up in the eastern waters. This is a, how nicely to be called the Minnetonka. Another boat on eastern waters built in 1894 a man named George Work was an avid sportsman. He was a celebrated wing shot and shooting game birds in flight and also noted horseman and road driver. That was shipped east in 1894. Another one that sailed on Lake Minnetonka was the Apuka in the summer of 1893 and then was shipped to Buzzards Bay, Massachusetts in 1894, where it was undefeated. The boat was owned by E.T. Tift of New York. He belonged to the Manchester Yacht Club. The exit was another dire, dire boat, and I apologize for the life of me, I could not find a picture of this boat. It was found, it found success in eastern, eastern waters. It was owned by, owned by a, by A. Henry Higginson. Higginson was a well-known sportsman, especially in fox hunting and in racing yachts. As you can see, he's got his fancy outfit on. During the 1895 sailing season, the exit in 19 starts with two Boston yacht, 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 yacht clubs the Corinthian and the Marblehead Yacht Clubs. The exit won 11 times, placed second four times, was third twice, and broke down once. In doing so, the exit was champion of both the Corinthian and Marblehead Yacht Clubs in 1895. Accolades continued in the Minnesota Times on October 13, 1895. It wrote that Minnetonka and Dyer are known known to the world, the yachting world, I should say. Mr. Dyer's success is phenomenal and wholly unequaled by any other boat builder in the country. Another owner of Arthur Dyer's boat praised him by saying, by far the fastest boats I have ever sailed in. Let's talk about the salmon. It was the largest yacht to be built on Lake Minnetonka, Waterline at 33 feet and over length at 44 feet. The salmon was the second boat purchased by W.E.C. Ustis of Boston. The salmon was delivered by rail to Boston in March of 1895. The salmon was an Ottawa type yacht with some changes in the boat. The salmon had a short life. It burned down March 1st, 1896, just the following year, along with the local boat workshop at Tournament Beach, Massachusetts. The salmon was in the shop because it was going to be rebuilt to be a wider, wider than Dyard had designed it. Critics said the salmon was fast with eased sails but it could not lug canvas windward against her beamier competitors. They also said that live ballast used by Dyer, Dyer in his smaller boats and narrower boats could not be relied on in a, on a larger boat like the salmon. 
Dyer's com competition. I should have called this Dyer's boat builder competition. <coughs> Dyer's f fame as a boat builder grew here and on the East Coast. Arthur Dyer was in agreement with another boat builder from New York named Thomas Clapham. He's the older gentleman right there. Both Clapham and Arthur Dyer were convinced it took less force required for boat, boat's hull to go over the water than rather going through it. Dyer was also compared with naval architect Nathaniel Hirishoff. If you can remember him, he built um, the last boat I talked about. I don't know, that's terrible, I don't remember at the moment. Um, I'll think about it. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, Harishoff was from Marblehead, Massachusetts and worked along with his brother John who was blind. Harishoff had several customers who had yachts on Lake Minnetonka which competed with Dyer boats. And the Anawa in 1893 built two of Harishoff's boats that were on Lake Minnetonka, the Alpha and the one I was trying to remember, the Kite. Nathaniel and his brother also built a series of world famous yachts, racing yachts that dominated America's Cup competition from 1893 to 1934. The United States won every America's Cup between 1851 and 1983 when Australia finally won. In May of 1895, there was gossip about Arthur Dyer that he could possibly build the next yacht to win America's Cup for the United States. There was much speculation in the newspapers here in, in Minnesota and on the East Coast. There was a syndicate formed, which is a group of individuals to promote a common interest and share the cost, who were campaigning for Arthur Dyer to build an 80-foot winner for the upcoming race for 1896. The syndicate was, as you see these three men, Hazen Burton of Deep Haven, W. E. Ostis, who Dyer had just built two boats, and General Charles Payne, a railroad executive and yachtsman who owned the Puritan Mayflower and the Volunteer which all successfully defended America's Cup against British, British contenders. As it turned out, the syndicate was forced by time not to follow this endeavor. There was too short a timeline with only 60 days to complete a new yacht and another 30 to fine tune the boat. Thus, the project was abandoned. Although Dyer did not get the opportunity to construct a cup defender, the competition and racing in America's Cup did help ignite the craze for yachting here in the United States and abroad. In 1895, Dyer put out what you would call a sales catalog of his boats. With Dyer's name in the news and his reputation of building racing renters, his boat business benefited with, from many orders. After the 1895 seasons, Dyer boats came in different grades of wood and price. In his 1896 catalog I just referenced, Dyer talked highly of his successful boats. The Marie was one of them. Dyer said, Marie, champion first class sloop of the Minnetonka Yacht Club in 1895. This boat is one of the best all round boats I have ever built, and I think her record would warrant her to be classed as the fastest 21 foot boat in the world. She is 30 feet overall. 21 feet actual water line, 8 foot beam, carries 640 feet of sail made of Staten Island cotton duct sail. Again in his catalog, Dyer made boats that came in different grades and, and wooden price. For the Marie, prices ranged from $1,300 for grade A or, or to grade E would for be for $600. You could own your own Ottawa for prices ranging $1,000 for grade A materials, or for grade E, if you had a pond in your backyard, $125. Or you could own the exit and read a testimony how A. Henry Higginson, 
the owner of the exit was truly satisfied owning a boat made by Arthur Dyer. Higginson stated Dyer could, be, could build the best and the fastest boats better than anyone in the United States. But not all boats were successful, according to Audi magazine from April's, the April 1897 issue. It would said the Swift, which was built for Lucian Swift, who was one of the owners of the Minneapolis Journal, the boat proved to be a total failure racing a craft along with the Raval built for the Donaldson brothers and the Alcyon for the Walker brothers. All three boats, the designer had gone to the extreme. Dyer was criticized cutting away the forward, the result being that they were all down in the head. The boats were fast on the free run, but when it came to windward work, they labored and could not be made to travel. Not so good there. Change the subject a little bit. Arthur and local politics. He was part of a group of neighbors involved in starting a school here in Deep Haven. One of the first, first one-room school opened in 1892 was located on the property donated by the Burton family. Arthur ran for a position on the 1897 Excelsior Township Board and was elected as a trustee on the Township Board and also was elected as Justice of the Peace. By 1900, Arthur joined the crusade to separate Excelsior Township. One of the reasons those who summer, had summer homes on Lake Minnetonka in the Deep Haven area, their homes were heavily evaluated and paid higher taxes than the farmers in the Lake Minnetonka area. The farmers liked the deal, less taxes and all the benefits. On June 11th, 1900, a petition was sent to the Hennepin County Board of Commissioners and unanimously voted to allow Dyer's Boat Works to be used as a voting destination where voters from Cottagewood, Somerville, Deep Haven, North Home, would come to place their votes. Final votes, you're gonna be amazed by this, 39, four, and seven against. Deep Haven was now a village over that vote. <laughs> Arthur Dyer was the re village recorder for the village city council from 1901 to 1914. Above is an ordinance that was advertised in the local paper it's hard to read, on automobiles. This is 1903. Speed limit was eight miles per hour, only four miles at any crosswalks. Horses have the right of way over cars. Fines for violation was not less than $5, nor, nor higher than $100 for each violation. I just wanna tell you, in 1903, $5 was equivalent to what it would be in 2023, it would be $169.98. So that was a huge fine, even $5 back then. Arthur's family life, lots of happiness and sadness. The death of Mrs. Mary Dyer, wife of, I author of uh, excuse me, Arthur Dyer, a well-known boat builder in Deep Haven on the shores of Lake Minnetonka occurred at 2 p.m. last Saturday after an illness of seven months, death caused by Bright's disease. The deceased was 35 years of age and was a sister of J.J. Lane of the NP Freight Office in this city. She leaves a husband, two sons, and a daughter. Well, what she had, they called kidney, uh, it's now called kidney disease, and she was only 35 years old. She, uh, his wife, Mary, they had three children together, Harold in 1894, Marie in 1897, and Herbert on October 26, 1902. So she died virtually months later after having her third baby. 
Seven months later, Arthur married again to Emma Frances McGuire on November 26, 1903. She was from Mondavi, Wisconsin. She died on, at 35 on August 24, 1906. Uh, his poor, poor luck here for Arthur and his, his, his wives. She was 35 years old where her remains, and she is buried in Mondavi, Wisconsin. Less than two years later, Arthur married again for a third time on April 23, 1908, to Gunda Joanne Berg. She came to America in 1903 from Norway with $5 in her pocket. She was 29 when she married Arthur. Arthur and Gunda had two daughters, <coughs> Ethelwyn in 1909 and Margaret in 1911. She lived a long life. She died in 1967 at 88 years old. In addition to losing his first wife to Bright's disease, he also lost two children, Harold and Marie, to the disease. Marie, is, she's, this is her yearbook picture from her West High School uh, that she went to in January of 1917. In a statement below, her senior high school picture was her, uh, was her, her the saying under her, which was, to live in the hearts we leave behind is not to die, which is really sad to hear someone so young is, you know, know that she's going to lose her life early. And I also showed this uh, map. She went to West High School, which was in downtown Minneapolis. The distance for Marie to travel high school by Minneapolis street, the streetcar system was over 15 miles by trolley one way. Harold John Dyer, 1894 to 1923. What you're looking at is his uh, his military draft card. It's from 1916. He was asking the military for an exemption from serving because of failed kidney operation. He entered the military in 1919 and served in France. He married in December of 1920 and died in 1923 at the age of 29. The registration card also showed that he worked for his father. Here's Arthur's surviving children. Herbert or Herbie Dyer, he was the only child that survived uh, and escaped his mother's uh, kidney disease. The other two are Margaret and Ethelwyn. Margaret was born in 1911, and Ethelwyn was born in 1909. More tragedy. Fire at the Dyer Boat Works, March 23, 1910. There's a small article, if you can't read it. It's at Deep Haven, Lake Minnetonka. The, the plant of Arthur Dyer Boat Works containing 43 boats, including the steamer Rambler, was destroyed. Fire was started by a spark from a passing locomotive. Lost will exceed $10,000. There were several prairie meadow fires in the same vicinity caused by the same locomotive. This was March 23, 1910. The boat works burned down. The loss exceeded over $10,000. In today's dollars, that would be $316,617. Just a small fortune. Another, uh, if you see the arrow, the Deep Haven Village Council had been meeting in a large eight-sided, 11-foot across office on the Dyer property for about six years. Elections were held on the second floor of the Cottagewood store or in the hall above the Deep Haven grocery store at Cowan's Corner. Dyer's Waterworks, 
I don't know if you know about this. In addition to his boat work business, Dyer owned the waterworks since 1909. It served cottage wood and piped well water into homes during the summer for bathing, laundering, and watering lawns. He still owned it in 1941, serving 47 homes when he asked the village of Deep Haven to buy it. If they did not, he would junk the system. The water tower is still standing in Cottage Woods today. I don't know if you guys know that. It's behind a few houses. The pipes went from Cottage Wood and as far as Linwood sections of Deep Haven. I don't know if, he was, if Deep Haven bought it. But I have heard that those who live in Cottage Wood have found pipes in their yards when they were doing some landscaping. Another thing Dyer did. Dyer became the postmaster for the Deep Haven Post Office. And you can see where it was. It was very convenient. If you see where Chimo is, and then where his, his, his property for his uh, little island is right there at the railroad tracks. You can see where it says Dyer. Uh, he, took the job, he took the job on May 22, 1912. He, as you can see, you can, that Dyer took the job from other well-known early settlers in Deep Haven. Sidney Woodford, who was from Kentucky, came to Deep Haven when the St. Louis Hotel opened. He had a stable next to the St. Louis Hotel, and he ran the Minnetonka Ice Yacht Club until it burned down. A.M. Shuck, known generally as A.M. or Bob Shuck, was the overseer of the Hazen Burton estate for many years, and he also ran a store, coached sports, and was the justice of the peace for Deep Haven. Dyer's job with the post office was discontinued on June 30th, 1914, when the post office moved to Excelsior. I don't know if you guys know this, half of Deep Haven still receives its mail from the Excelsior post office if you're in the 55331, and the other half, what's the other half, guys? That's right. How many are here? 55391. Yeah, not many. <laughs> Any case, um, I just thought that was interesting. It hasn't changed since he lost the job in 1914. Ellen Wilson Meyer, who wrote many of the books for the ELMHS, was friends with Arthur's daughter, Ethelwyn and Margaret Dyer. They all went to Deep Haven schools together. So if you can see, uh, here's, Ethel is on the right of the first picture over here, and Margaret Dyer, she is right dead center, and right above her, with that smiley face, that's Ellen Wilson Meyer. Ellen described Arthur Dyer during the 1920s as a man who seemed quite formidable. He seemed older than his 50 plus years. He was tall, raw boned, and slightly stooping, had piercing eyes, bushy eyebrows, and a beak of a nose. He always wore work clothes, trousers, shirt, and a sweater, or a jacket, but never a suit as far as I can remember. You kind of get a good idea of Arthur Dyer there. Arthur Dyer retires. Arthur Dyer retired on April, April 6, 1928, after a windstorm leveled the Dyer boat works. He was 59 at the time. The storm was considered a tornado with scores of buildings destroyed or damaged, with two fatalities and 25 people were reported injury, injured. Many were struck by flying debris. The damaged building was sold to T.B. Walker's grandsons, Stephen and Walter Walker, in October 1928. And they rebuilt the Boat Works building, which is of the picture of this. This is what this picture is. The building that you're seeing here was ultimately destroyed in the 1965 tornado. I could not find a picture, but it was pretty much the same uh, shape of, and building. 
Arthur's legacy. Arthur, 79 years old, died on October 3rd, 1949, 20 years after he retired from building boats. He had a true talent crafting and making boats. He made a huge impact on the boating world here and across the United States. He changed the way yachts were designed, which were to glide over the water and not plow through the water. When Dyer built the Ottawa, the eyes of the sailing world were on him. On him, Deep Haven, Excelsior, and the Lake Minnetonka area. During his career, 27 boats made their home on Lake Minnetonka and many more elsewhere. Lake Minnetonka became a destination where we could show our, off our great summer weather, our hotels during Arthur's time, and the Minnetonka Yacht Club, which was considered the most progressive inland yachting organization recognized. Arthur Dyer chose to live here and to run his business on Carson's Bay. Dyer participated in becoming a village he became an integral part along with an early founding members and in forming, helping in uh, forming the village of Deep Haven. He was a major influencer along with Hayes and Burton to separate from Excelsior. It only took 10% or 39 votes to approve and to separate from Excelsior Township and become a village of Deep Haven. Thank you for attending, and thanks to the Excelsior Brewery for hosting our event. Thanks, guys. Woo! Yeah. Yeah. I want to also make a special thanks to Scott McGinnis for, and Lisa Stevens for their help with my presentation of Arthur Dyer. And I do want to show off, just for a visual effect, See all these little tabs in this book? This is the book that's for sale right now. All the ones that are tab are dire books, are dire boats, I should say. That's how many, how much he influenced the Lake Minnetonka area. And this is a fabulous book. A little sales pitch there, Scott. So thank you. Thanks, you guys. is it. Now, we received some information back in 1980, or the Excelsior Historical Society received a, um, some information that was requested from them. The, these cousins lived out in California, and they sent a number of pictures, and I did not trust their identification of their photos. They had um, Enoch Dyer, which was Solon Dyer's brother, marked as their father, and I knew it could not have been his father because it was taken in downtown Minneapolis. So there was a, a picture of an older gentleman, and they said that that was Arthur I couldn't trust the source, sorry to say. Yeah, if you guys have any pictures of family photos going back, we'd love to see them. It would really make me happy and the ELMHS happy also. So I want your name and your address so I can contact you guys. I would love it. Anything else? Thanks, you guys. Excellent job. Thank you. Thank you.